our second speaker is uh, Nathan Chen, who will talk about abelian sub, uh, subfaces revised. Yeah, please. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for letting me speak today. Uh, right, so I want to talk about uh, abelian surfaces, uh, and this is something which um, there are some results here that have been known for, for a few years, but uh, this is a new perspective. So let me start with the primary object of study here, uh, which is an abelian variety. Um, okay, so in, in broad strokes, this is a complex torus, which can be embedded into complex projective space. Now, more concretely, this complex torus uh, is the quotient of C to the G modulo some lattice uh, lambda of rank 2G. And uh, the fact that it can be embedded into complex projective space, you can rephrase this in terms of the existence of an ample line bundle. Uh, but you can also think about this uh, as the existence of a positive 1-1 one, one, uh, Kähler, Kähler form integral Kähler form. And uh, another perspective is you can, so you can get a Hermitian form H on C to the G, such that when you take its imaginary part and you restrict to the lattice lambda, this becomes integer value. Okay, so uh, now this imaginary part uh, of, of your Hermitian form is going to be some non-degenerate alternating uh, bilinear form on your lattice. And the elementary divisor theorem says that after a change of basis, this matrix can be given by some uh, diagonal form. So you can write it in block form as zero D minus D and zero, where D here is a diagonal matrix uh, with, with zeros uh, above and below. And uh, so the main point here that I want to make is, so just as we saw in, in Fred's talk uh, earlier, if we want to work with families, we should take pairs of abelian varieties. So not just a complex torus, but you also want to add on this ample line bundle, uh, which you can rephrase in terms of a Hermitian form, H, uh, that can be, that has some nice diagonal form. And so we call this pair, uh, a polarized abelian variety of type D1 up to DG, if it can be written in this, if we, we can write it in this form. Now these integers DIs, uh, so typically when you write it in this form, D1 divides D2 and which divides D3 and so on. So you can more or less assume that D1 is one here. Uh, this just amounts, uh, in your polarized abelian variety, this amounts to taking some root of your original ample line bundle. Okay, so this is the uh, picture for, for the objects of study. Now let's look at what happens in dimension one. So inside of uh, C2, let's consider the zero locus of this uh, equation. So y squared equals some cubic in x. And if we compactify uh, both sides. So C, we turn into CP2 uh, by adding on the projective line at infinity. And this equation will compactify into some homogeneous degree three polynomial, uh, the zero locus of that polynomial in CP2. Uh, and if you have a smooth zero locus, then it will turn out that this, this gives an elliptic curve. Uh, in other words, an abelian variety of dimension one. So this is an, a different way of producing uh, in, in abelian variety, not from taking C and then quotienting by some lattice, but from some nice projective geometry. Now let's go back to this description. Uh, we have inside of C2, we have the zero locus of some poly polynomial. There's a map from C2 to C, which is given by just forgetting the Y coordinate, you send X, Y to X. And if you restrict this map to the zero locus, what, well, so this will turn out to be a degree two map. And it's easy to see that you fix some X in the base. If you plug it into the right side uh, here and solve, you get two points. Uh, so this gives you a two to one cover 
from the zero locus, uh, it will be branched uh, wherever the right hand side is zero. And now if you extend to compactifications, this zero locus turns into an elliptic curve and the base C here turns into CP1. So this gives you, this gives a nice realization of an elliptic curve as a two to one branch cover of CP1. Another way of seeing this is if you have a cubic in CP2, you can project away from any point on that cubic and that will, that will be a two to one map. Okay, now the topological picture here is, so we have our elliptic curve, uh, which I'll label as E. And there's an involution, it's an abelian group. So there's a map which sends X to minus X. If you quotient by this map, uh, you can imagine taking your two torus and rotating by 180 degrees. And so every, every point up here gets identified with a point down here when you quotient by the, by the minus X goes to minus X map. Uh, and so you're more or less keeping track of just the upper piece of a two torus. And you have to be careful about gluing along the boundaries uh, where the, you have to be careful about gluing uh, along these, these circles. So the upper circle gets identified with the bottom dashed circle. Uh, and if you glue appropriately, it's like taking a cylinder and closing the ends, you end up with a copy of uh, the Riemann sphere. CP1. Okay, so this is another way of seeing that these elliptic curves have two to one maps uh, to CP1. Now in higher dimension, rational maps are, they're much trickier. So you can, you can so far we've only looked at morphisms. So these are maps which are defined everywhere. Uh, but you can also talk about rational maps, and you should think of these as the analogs of maybe uh, meromorphic functions. So these rational maps are only only defined generically. Uh, they're defined away from sub, some sub variety in in the domain. So we'll denote a rational map uh, by by a dash arrow. And just as a as a first example. There are no non-constant morphisms from CP2 to CP1, but there's lots of rational maps from CP2 to CP1. So one way of seeing this is, I mean, there's, there's many ways of showing this, uh, but maybe a quick way is, suppose you had a morphism from CP2 to CP1. Uh, let's zero and infinity in CP1. Now the pre-images of zero and infinity will be two divisors. Uh, in other words, there'll be two co-dimension one subvarieties in CP2. So there'll be two algebraic curves in CP2. And by Bezu's theorem, we know that two curves always meet uh, in, in some number of points. So um, th this gives the contradiction. Such a map can't be defined at the points of intersection uh, of, of these two fibers. Thank you for such a nice proof. Oh, yeah, no problem. Now, the question in higher dimension is, so if you start with an abelian variety of dimension G, what sort of low degree coverings from your abelian variety to projective space are there? Name, and, and not only just an arbitrary projective space, I'd like to realize, uh, so before we had these, this map, this two to one map from an elliptic curve to P1, so you, the elliptic curve, you saw it was a cover of a branch cover of P1. And you can ask the analog here. There won't, in general, there will not be, it's, you, you can show that there are no morphisms to PG, but you can ask uh, what sort of rational maps are there? And the existence of these rational maps is always guaranteed. If you take a, an object of projective variety, you can project away from it. Um, and land in a projective space of the same dimension as your original variety. And algebraically, this is known as Noether normalization. So can we realize in higher dimension abelian varieties as low degree covers of PG? And this question is especially interesting because 
the canonical bundle on an abelian variety is trivial. So in the last few years, there's been a lot of study uh, of this question, what sort of low degree covers from various classes of varieties to projective space are there? Um, so in particular for hypersurfaces, uh, this has been studied by, um, for hypersurfaces of large degree, this has been stu stu uh, studied by several people. Um, and building on that, uh, if, if your canonical bundle has positivity, in general, you expect to not have low degree covers. Uh, but here, the canonical bundle of an abelian variety is trivial. Uh, so there's, in fact, there's only one global section, uh, the constants. And so um, you can, can you add- add the phrase low degree covering means? Sure. Um, so this is, uh, when I say low degree covering, I mean, so generically, uh, this is D to one. Uh, if you take a general point in PG and you take its pre-image, so this is uh, this map is going to be dominant onto its image. If you take a general point in PG and you take its pre-image, there are D points, and uh, it's possible these rational coverings. It is possible that they contract some subvarieties, uh, but there will be subvarieties, and so this is uh, the property of degree is is still what I find. It's, it's generic. What does low mean? Right. So so low is that's right. So let me let me go to the next slide. That's a, that's a good point. So here earlier I was talking about families of abelian varieties. Uh, so you should take an abelian variety together with a, an ample line bundle. So let me specialize to the case of abelian surfaces. Uh, so these carry a line bundle of type one D. Let's say. And concretely, this abelian surface embeds into projective space of dimension d minus one, and the self-intersection of the line bundle is 2D. So what's the smallest degree of irrational covering from an abelian surface to CP2? Um, and this is an abelian, it's a polarized abelian surface. So it's, it carries a line bundle of type 1D. That's the question. Does the degree of such a map, does it depend on the degree of the polarization? Can you find uh, some a uh, bound which is linear? Um, and well, the answer to find a bound which is linear, you just do projection. Um, a linear bound will uh, sort of come naturally. And in fact, you can Stapleton has shown that you can do you can do better. You can find a bound which grows in square root. Uh, but it turns out that there are always four to one rational covers from an abelian surface to CP two. So this is this degree here is independent of the value uh, d, and and this is somewhat surprising. Uh, now on the flip side, you can ask, uh, is four to one the best that you can do? And there's a theorem of Martin which says that for most polarizing degrees, uh, yes, the answer is yes. So the smallest degree of a cover from a one d polarized abelian surface to CP two is four, um, at least four or general uh, abelian surfaces. So this, this more or less uh, describes the, this more or less des describes this, the analog of the two to one cover from an elliptic curve to P1 uh, entirely in higher, for, for abelian surfaces, uh, at least for most polarized stations. Are, are there any examples less than four? Uh, yes, so if D is equal to two, uh, a one two polarized abelian surface has a degree three map, but that case is very special. Uh, a one two polarization is the same thing as the existence of a genus three curve in, in the linear system, a smooth genus three curve. And genus three curves uh, can always be realized as plane cortex. And so they have three to one maps to P1. And, and so there's, there's a lot of geometry that goes into uh, using that three to one map on a genus three curve to construct a three to one map from the abelian surface to, to CP2. But that's so far, that's the only example that's known. I think there's a theorem in topology that a map from T4 with four real torus to S4, which is a branch covering, 
has to have at least degree four in topology. But that's the S4, not the CP2. So, and uh, CP2 modulo complex conjugation is S4. So, anyway. anyway it's, it's, you mean branch cover? Yeah, branch cover, and, but in the real sense. You know, it's just thinking of these T4, and for every dimension n, Tn to Sn, the degree is at least n in real variables. I mean, that's just a topology theorem. But does that have to be everywhere defined? An honest yes. mapping? Yes, it's an actual branch cover everywhere that's defined. Right. right, so these aren't everywhere defined. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they're holomorphic. <laughs> right. Right. In some on some open set. Right. So let me there there's sort of a new perspective on uh, be, 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 before you go on, uh, is there a meaning to four, like two to the two? I uh, mean uh, yes. is, is is anything known in higher dimensions, at least conjecturally? Oh, because 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 elliptic curves are two to one. I mean, in dimension one is two to one, and then right. So for products of elliptic curves, uh, the same argument will give you a two to the g um, bound. But I think in general, it's I think it's actually not expected that. So so this theorem I think is you expect this theorem an analog of this to be false in higher dimension. Uh, so I think the bound in general, you'll probably, the, the bound that you get will probably have to depend on D and it will grow like D to some power. Uh, that's you mind if I add something? Sure. Yeah, uh, I, you can get a 2G lower bound for higher dimensional, very general higher dimensional for, for high degree polarizations. So, I mean, from, I would, you know, you can take four to be 2G if you want. <laughs> That's one way to see how four shows up. But that's only a lower bound. That's not a it's not an upper bound. Right. So let me let me say briefly uh, what the what the idea here is. Uh, so this is sort of a new a new perspective on um, constructing these degree four maps, these degree four covers. So if I start with an abelian surface, you can cook up something called a Coomer K3 surface. So the abelian surface has a map, the inverse map. And if you quotient by this inverse map, you get something which is singular. It has lots of double points. And if you resolve, you end up with a smooth K3 surface. Um, so this is a, a surface with trivial canonical bundle uh, and uh, it's simply connected. And so the real content of this, of the theorem I just mentioned is that every Coomer K3 surface carries an elliptic vibration with at least four sections. And uh, let me just add that this four is a complete coincidence from the degree four that we saw earlier. Uh, this just happens to, you only need one section to prove the theorem on the previous slide, but in fact, these will always have four sections. Uh, and so the idea here is once you construct this elliptic vibration with at least four sections, so that general fiber is a smooth elliptic curve. And as we saw, it has a two to one map to P1. And this, the existence of this section, which is in purple here, allows you to glue the two to one maps, uh, the, these two to one maps on, on the fibers. And so what you end up with is a map from your K3 sur surface, your Coomer K3 surface uh, to a P1 bundle over P1. which is rational, which is uh, birational to CP2. And now if you compose with the map, with a two to one map from your abelian surface, you compose these maps, uh, you get your four to one rational map. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the main uh, machine behind this. Uh, yeah, and let me, let me stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions? How do you realize this elliptic vibration? Uh, right. Uh, so the sections that you construct, uh, you can do this either on the abelian surface or the 
K3 surface, it's sort of a dual picture. On the abelian surface, you take sections which pass through the, uh, the two torsion points. They pass through the, so there you have the X goes to minus X and there's lots of, there's 16 fixed points. And you take curves which pass with high multiplicity through these points. Um, so that's, that's on the abelian surface picture. Now, so this will give you curves with ordinary singularities. Uh, it'll turn out that these, these curves have ordinary singularities. And if you blow up these two torsion points, these curves will sort of smooth themselves out and their images will give you the elliptic vibration on the K3 surface. Could I hear the general theorem again that preceded this proposition? Sure. Uh, so yeah, there's always four to one rational covers. And for most degree Ds, uh, four is sharp. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, so I mean, there is this, there is a comment about the topological thing. I, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, so that in topology, you, you don't have these rational maps uh, defined. You just have the notion of well-defined branch covers, okay? And then it's, here's a statement, first of all. Every oriented connected n-manifold is a branch cover over the n-sphere with at most n sheets. That's a statement, okay? Just that's, first that's just a statement, okay? So, you know, that is it. And then, if that statement is true, n is sharp because the because of the n torus. The n torus illustrates the maximum number of sheets you need. So that kind of fits with this discussion. And that statement's known for n equals one, two, three, and four, and it's unknown above four. And in dimensions three and four, it's related to interesting topology. You know about three manifolds and four manifolds. So it's kind of an analogous discussion. It goes back about for 30 years, and it's completely wide open in higher dimensions. Except there is this argument that the end torus illustrates the sharp statement. Do people believe that it's true in higher dimensions? Well, there's evidence because it's true in one, two, three, and four, and it's the proof in three is like by Edmund a long time ago, long time ago, 30 years ago, and then, and then, uh, in four, it was very clever use. This is like a very strong topologist got it four. And then for the end torus, it's an elementary but not trivial argument that you need at least n sheets. So it's a nice statement and it's true four times. And then, you know, and then there's arguments of going back to Alexander that you just take a triangulation of it. If you don't care about the degree, you just take a triangulation and you throw the vertices into Rn or the sphere of the same dimension, Rn compactified, and you just linearly mm. fill them in and you, you map the simplex so the orientation is positive. So you, you make it go either inside the, the points or outside the points, you know, the simplex passing through infinity. And that gives you a branch cover and then but this is Alexander's proof. And, and then there are some refinements of that geometry. So there's always a branch cover of every oriented n-manifold into the n-sphere. It's a little like algebraic geometry. You always have a, some branch cover. And, then, and then, there, then it stops. I mean, you have to start doing stuff. And in low dimensions, you can do geometry. And anyway, so you don't know. Yeah. Just, can can just, I ask what's, what's the input for four-dimensional thing? What? What's the input for four-dimensional torus? Like, what do you need to prove it's at least four? Oh, just it's a cohomology argument, and you know, topological algebraic topology argument. Yeah, it's like a hard exercise, which I can't do right now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. But I mean, it's it's doable. But you know, and for the n torus, I mean, it works in every n. You know. Anyway, it's just curious that there's a pattern of statements that are kind of, you know, roughly parallel to these questions, but, you know, slightly different.
And I always liked the fact that branch covers could be defined so simply. It just means a simplicial map so that each simplex, top simplex, goes with the correct orientation. Because then, as you cross a wall, things don't fold back if they go with the right orientation. So then the singularities are in co-dimension two. So that looks like a branch cover. So, I mean, the definition is very mm -hmm. elegant, what a branch cover means. You know, it's just something that's generically positive orientation, uh, and then it, mm -hmm. it only winds around in co-dimension two. Okay, then thank you again for the talk. Yeah, thank you for the comments.